Thank you. And I'm so sorry. Welcome to our discussion on sound chase. And to the man who needs no introductions, writer, scholar, and lawyer, Jenny Starr. Thank you. Uh, it is Sunday morning, so let us start with Chase's Christian faith. Salmon Portland Chase was born in Cornish, New Hampshire in 1808 and baptized soon thereafter into the Episcopal Church. Now, in 1808, there were very few Episcopalians in rural New Hampshire. The dominant church there was the Congregational Church. And the only reason that there even was an Episcopal Church in the little town of Cornish was that, let's say, 15 years earlier, uh, Chase's uncle, Philander, came across a copy of the Episcopal Prayer Book. And he read the prayer book, and he was so impressed that he immediately converted to the Episcopal faith and decided that, that this was his career as an Episcopal priest. And he converted his family to the Episcopal faith, and he converted the whole town to the Episcopal faith. They put up an Episcopal church because of his determination. Um, so that by the time young Salmon was born, there was a building, and indeed the building that was built in the year of his birth, 1808, is still there. Um, this is for you, Bill. Um, the, according to an architectural guide, it is an unsophisticated, unpretentious, even stark in its simplicity, but nevertheless picturesque and beautiful in its rural setting. It's sort of like a congregational church building, but for the Episcopalians. Chase's boyhood ended abruptly um, when he was nine. His father died of a stroke. Uh, leaving uh, the widow and 10 children and almost no money. Um, and a couple years later, in part, I think, to save money, uh, Chase's mother sent the boy to Ohio to live with the uncle, Philander, who was now the first Episcopal bishop of Ohio. Um, in those days, there were not many Episcopalians in Ohio either. It was a new, young, raw state. So the Episcopal income was not much. And in order to make ends meet, he had a farm. And Chase spent, young Chase, spent a lot of that first year on the farm doing farm work. He also went to school. The second year that he lived with his uncle, um, they were in the city of Cincinnati because the uncle had been asked to become the president of Cincinnati College. And Chase attended college classes as a teenage boy there. Bishop Philander Chase was an intelligent, diligent, difficult, disputatious man. A few years later, when the bishop's uh, tenure at Kenyon College came to a bitter end in a dispute with the trustees, Chase wrote to a friend, the younger Chase, that the bishop was, quote, never qualified for the government of young men. He explained that, quote, for founding a college, for encountering and overcoming obstacles where everything depends upon energy and impulse, he is admirably qualified. But in duties which demand mildness, patience, and forbearance, he will always be wanting. Um, and then a few years later, recalling the bishop, Chase, Salmon Chase put it more plainly, describing his uncle as being, quote, quite tyrannical. Um, a friend asked, well, what are they going to be interested in at church? I said, well, I think they're going to be interested in the bishop. <laughs> Um, Chase remained in Ohio, could have remained in Ohio for kind of the rest of his life, but um, Bishop Chase um, got very frustrated that the Eastern bishops wouldn't answer his letters and his pleas for money to help build up Ohio, and he decided to kind of go over their head and go to England, where he would have a fundraising tour to raise money for an Episcopal college in Ohio. That's what's known as Kenyon today, Kenyon College. Um, and to get, to get to England, you had to get to New York City. And so they left Ohio, 
with the bishop um, holding the reins of the wagon and a, a, a horse in front and the family in the back. And I think that probably Salmon, who was by this point 13, 14, probably walked most of the way to, to New York State. We know that he left, after he and the bishop parted ways, the bishop to get on his boat, that, that Salmon walked the last hundred miles to home in New Hampshire. He taught school there for about a year to raise money, and then he went to Dartmouth College, where his uncle and indeed several uncles had gone. And in his senior year of college, Dartmouth was convulsed by a religious revival. Now, up to this point, Chase's college letters were all a, were kind of typical college letters. They were about pranks and studies and friendships. But suddenly, his, his college letters become almost religious tracts, um, urging his friends to, to find Jesus. Um, he wrote to a college classmate who was away from school that compared to last fall, the college seems very sober this spring. In chapel this evening, you might have heard a pin drop, so attentive and silent were the students. In another letter, he commented on the role of the women of Hanover. And mind you, at this point, Dartmouth is an entirely male institution. But according to Chase, the revival commenced among the young ladies, all of whom, without exception, have become seriously disposed. And that raises an interesting question for which I really don't have an answer, which is how this religious enthusiasm among the women of Hanover somehow infected the young men of Dartmouth. I, I'll just leave that. I'll just leave that. <laughs> so after he graduated, number eight in the class of 26, he went to Washington, D.C. He was actually thinking that he might become an Episcopal minister, but he didn't think about that for very long. Um, he decided on a legal career, and he, he taught school, again, to raise money, and he read law with the Attorney General, William Wirt, for there really weren't any law schools in these days. He went to church every Sunday. Um, he went, among others, to uh, what we call the Church of the Presidents, St. John's Episcopal Church, just north of the White House there. He taught Sunday school there. Uh, he often attended services at the Presbyterian Church, where he became a friend of the minister. One Sunday morning, when the bad weather caused other churches to cancel their services, he went to services at Ebenezer Methodist down near the Washington Navy Yard, and he wrote in his diary about how the preacher described the tortures of hell and the pleasures of paradise. The congregation participated fully. Some shouted aloud in anticipation of heaven, while others, quote, shrieked in dread of hell, and sobs and groans resounded through the house. Now, he didn't say this in his diary, but I'm practically positive that this was, if not a completely black congregation, uh, an interracial congregation. Um, there were actually many interracial congregations before the Civil War. What we know as the, the black church really sort of finds its own after the war. And this would be Chase's pattern throughout his, his life. He attended services every Sunday generally didn't do any legal or other work on Sunday. He would begin each day with prayer, and his diary and letters are filled with, you know, religious material. So one uh, <clears throat> month at the end of his diary, and I put this one in for you, Cindy. This is the last weekday of a month by no means adequately improved. How little have I done for the Savior or for souls? With only two or three have I conversed on religious subjects at all. He was trying at this point to memorize the longest psalm in the Bible, the 119th psalm, and he meant, quote, to continue to do so until I can repeat it with facility from beginning to end. He was also teaching Sunday school, and he noted in his diary that he should pay more attention to the speeches he had prepared for these youngsters to try to make them more interesting and instructive. 
I gather that Sunday school was much more a lecture phenomenon than what we think of as arts and crafts. Um, religion was important to Chase in part because death was such an important part of his life. He married three times, and all three of those wives died within a few years of their marriages. He had six children, and all but two of those children died as toddlers. Um, only two of them survived to adulthood. He was one of 11 children, and by the time he was in his early 60s, all of his siblings had died. All right. After the death of one sister by a stroke, he wrote that perhaps, quote, I shall reach the allotted term of three score and 10, now not remote, but it may be also that a year, a month, a week may bring the end of earth. All he could do, he wrote, was his duty, quote, to man and to God, to strive to be what he requires, whether, whether for one day or many years which I think is actually a pretty good quote to put up on your, in front of your desk. I could go on about Chase's faith, but it is also Black History Month, and so I want to shift gears. While he lived in Washington, which was, after all, a slave society, about 4,000 slaves in a population of, let's say, 40,000, Chase was not opposed to slavery. The truth is, he wrote to a friend, that little cause exists for that sickly sympathy which many at the North feel, or affect to feel, with the fancied suffering of the slave. The master has a far more just claim upon our commiseration, for it is a truth that the people of the South live in continual apprehension of an insurrection among their slaves. In another letter, however, Chase related a conversation he had with a young slave boy who disagreed with the whites who were talking about colonization of the slaves to Africa. The boy, Chase wrote, did not want to leave all he holds dear. He feels in all its force the amor patria, love of country, which makes the Greenlander prefer the rough and bleak land which God hath given him to the fairest portion of the earth. America is as much the home of the Negro, whose father's fathers have lived here and died, as it is of the American white man, whose foot not many centuries ago had never pressed the soil, which now he so proudly claims as his peculiar inheritance. It is hard to imagine an aristocratic white southerner writing those words, sympathizing with the black boy's love of America. So perhaps the best way to summarize Chase's early views on slavery is that they were mixed or confused. So when and how did Chase convert to anti-slavery? And I use that word convert quite consciously because I think it was a conversion process. It was partly through reading. He read books about the horrors of Southern slavery and books, legal books, talking about how the Constitution did not really support slavery. It was partly a religious experience. He came to, in part by worshiping with blacks, he came to see slavery as being inconsistent with the central command of the Bible, to love your neighbor. And it was also partly a matter of his legal work. He represented black clients in Cincinnati, many of them seeking their freedom. The most notable case was that of Matilda, a young woman who was so white that she could pass as white, although she had at least some black blood. She walked away from her white master, who might well have been her father, when they arrived in Cincinnati in 1836. She found a job as a housekeeper and then her master somehow learned where she was and filed a lawsuit saying, no, this is my slave, she belongs to me. And Chase represented Matilda in that lawsuit. He argued that she wasn't really a fugitive slave. After all, the master had brought her to Ohio. She hadn't fled from Kentucky or another slave state. She'd been brought there. So when she was brought to the free state of Ohio, she became free. 
And besides, Chase said, the fugitive slave law was unconstitutional. There's a great little detail for you trial lawyers in the, in the book, Jerry. At that point, the opposing lawyer leaps to his feet and says, what, are we going to debate at this late date the constitutionality of the fugitive slave law? And Chase, who's already on his feet, says, well, yes, because if the fugitive slave law isn't constitutional, then on what legal basis is she being held? He lost all these arguments, and Matilda was taken from the courtroom by her master's hired hands, and we do not know what happened to Matilda after that. But Chase published his Matilda argument in a pamphlet, and it thus becomes kind of a resource for other lawyers arguing similar cases. Now, at this point, the late 1830s, Chase is not yet fully committed to anti-slavery. Um, in the 1840 presidential election, he supports his friend and neighbor, William Henry Harrison, who's the Whig candidate for the presidency. He does not support another friend, James Burney, who's the Liberty Party or abolitionist candidate. But a little bit later, after the death of his friend Harrison, um, in 1841, Chase leaves the Whig Party and joins the Liberty Party, this tiny group of eccentrics, weirdos, um, as they're viewed, and he sets out to change that party. But let's stick with blacks and slavery for a moment. A few years later, um, after another of these fugitive slave cases, the black community of Cincinnati says, we've got to thank this guy somehow. So they commission a black silversmith to create a little silver pitcher. Uh, there's a picture of it in the book, and it's in a museum in Cincinnati now. And at a ceremony at a black church, they present the pitcher to, um, to Chase. A black, I, I initially thought he was a preacher, but he, in fact, he was a barber, a black barber. Uh, gives a long speech uh, to Chase, sort of thanking him for his work for the black community. And Chase gives a long speech um, uh, you know, to, to his black audience and through them, the black community. Um, he denounced in that speech the provision of the Ohio State Constitution, which prevented blacks from voting. He said, quote, true democracy makes no inquiry about the color of the skin or the place of nativity, or any other similar circumstance or condition. And the Wall Street Journal last weekend in the review, they, they, they put that quote right up at the top of the page in big letters, and I'm glad they did, because if I had, if there's one quote of Chase's that I would love to get into circulation, it's that one. He, in the same speech, he denounced the provisions of state law that prevented what we would call integrated education in Ohio. By and large, to the extent black children were going to school, they were going to black schools organized and paid for by their parents, not to the public schools. And he condemned the Ohio law which prevented blacks from testifying in court against whites, saying that, quote, almost all humane and benevolent people oppose this exclusion. You might be wondering how I know exactly what he said on a Sunday morning in this black church, and the answer is that once again he printed this in a pamphlet um, and distributed it widely, and it was then quoted against him in later political campaigns. Um, sounding like a preacher in this, in this Sunday morning speech, he said that slavery was not something that came down from heaven, like some preachers claimed. No, it was something that came up from hell. Let us hope that it will go down, and that right speedily to its place of origin, and no, no resurrection. So I could go on about Chase and blacks and slavery, but I want to allow some time for questions, because I know there are going to be some, and I want also to at least sketch his political career. Um, during the 1840s, he turned that tiny fringe party, the Liberty Party, into a bigger party. And then in 1848, he arranged kind of a three-way merger of the Liberty Party with anti-slavery elements of the Republicans and Democrats into what was called the Free Soil Party. He was, he was the 
chairman of the first Free Soil National Convention. He wrote the famous platform, and he then campaigned for Free Soil candidates. Um, because of a kind of even split in the state legislature, the Free Soil Party had the balance of power in the winter of 48-49. And as part of a legislative compromise with the Democrats, they said, well, let's send Salmon Chase to Washington as a Democratic Free Soil Senator. That's what happened. So Chase's first major national position is as a senator from 1849 to 1855. He's a senator at the same time as Henry Clay and John Calhoun and Daniel Webster. He speaks against what we call the Compromise of 1850, particularly the Fugitive Slave Law. He speaks against the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. He kind of fans the flames of northern anger against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and out of that fire emerges the Republican Party. In 1856, the Republicans of Ohio nominate him for governor, and he wins. He's the first Republican governor of a major state from 1857 through early 1860. So, and again, slavery and blacks are a kind of a central part of what he does as governor. He, for example, gets the legislature to pass a state law against kidnapping because all too often the fugitive slave law is used to kidnap people who've never been slaves, who've never been in the South. In 1860, he was a leading candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. But the Republicans knew that if they wanted to win, they were going to have to persuade moderates. And Chase, by this point, is anything but a moderate. Uh, and so the Republicans nominate someone who has, how should we say, less of a record, uh, this relative unknown Abraham Lincoln. Um, and Chase is okay with that. I mean, he's disappointed, understandably, but he goes out and spends the fall of 1860, campaigning for Lincoln and ensuring that Lincoln is elected. Lincoln rewards him by making him Secretary of the Treasury, which is one of the sort of key positions in his cabinet. So that's his kind of third major position, Secretary of the Treasury during the Civil War. He raises the money that equips the Union Army, but he also continues his fight for racial justice and black rights notably in pressing Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. He and Lincoln don't always agree, and he, <clears throat> at one point in a quarrel, uh, submits a resignation and then is quite shocked when Lincoln accepts it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, it's, um, it, it, the, I, I have a pretty much minute-by-minute minute account of that day in the book and he's in the Senate pressing for a bit of legislation, and, and a senator receives a message and says, have you resigned? Because I'm being asked to go to the Senate floor to consider the nomination of your successor. And Chase kind of hits his forehead and says, oh, damn, he accepted my resignation. <laughs> um, uh, and it, for a while, he's quite bitter at Lincoln. He really thinks that Lincoln should have kept him on in the Treasury. But he gets over that, and he again campaigns for Lincoln. In the midst of that 1864 presidential election, the Chief Justice dies. And after thinking about his choices for a while, Lincoln nominates Chase. Um, he may not have done so entirely happily. One Washington insider uh, wrote in a letter that Lincoln, I love this quote, was a man who keeps a grudge as faithfully as any Christian. <laughs> and that he consented to Mr. Chase's elevation only when the pressure became very general and very urgent. In other words, at least according to this letter, Lincoln only nominated Chase because the senators told him that if he nominated anyone else, the nomination was going to go down in flames. Be that as it may, he nominated Chase, and in those days, there wasn't this 
you know, we're, we're right now in the midst of a discussion about a, a nomination and it will take, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks before the woman is confirmed. In those days, things went more quickly. Uh, the nomination was submitted at about two o'clock and it was, he was confirmed by four o'clock when he arrived <laughs> in, in Washington by train. So for the next eight years, his kind of fourth major position is as Chief Justice of the United States. And he, um, you know, considers and decides a whole slew of cases and he re remains very active in politics. Um, many of the cases that he faced involved blacks and black rights. Let me talk about just one. As a circuit justice, he considered the case of a young black girl whose mother had signed an agreement on the day after slavery ended in Maryland. It was an apprenticeship agreement that bound her daughter, who was at the time, let's say, 12, to work as a, quote, apprentice for her former master for the next six years. And Chase reviewed this agreement line by line, and he compared it to the apprenticeship agreements that existed in Maryland for whites at that time. And he said, look, this isn't apprenticeship. This is a form of slavery. And it's inconsistent with, by that point, the 13th Amendment was part of the Constitution. It's inconsistent with the 13th Amendment. And so it's illegal. And thus, Chase granted freedom to that young black girl and to hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of similarly situated black apprentices in the state of Maryland. So I'm going to pause there. I, again, I could go on for a very long time, but I'm going to pause there because I know that this group will have some questions. Mr. Croner. <laughs> I think one of the single most surprising quotations from him in the entire book is late in his life when he's Supreme Court Justice. He is lobbying for recognition of Supreme Court justices in history. And there is a quote, and this is a man who's put together the free so far to all these things. He says, there needs to, Mr. Justice Tony was a great, great justice. He just made this one little, little mistake with the Red Sky. How can you reconcile that with his lifetime? With his, uh, his Chase's lifetime. All right, so just to amplify a bit, for those who are not on a first name basis with Chief Justice Roger Tawney. So, um, <laughs> so, the, the, the chief justice immediately before Sam and Chase was a man from Maryland by the name of Roger Tawney. He owned slaves early in his life, but later um, freed them. But he, right, but he was the author of one of, actually, I would say the most, the worst decision of, of American constitutional law, the Dred Scott decision in 1858 which declared that not only was this particular black person not entitled to sue, but no blacks were ever going to be citizens of the United States. Um, and that decision is in some respects, you know, it's a significant cause of the Civil War. And so after Tawney's death, there was a debate about, you know, what should be done. You know, for example, in the Supreme Court, there were busts of the former chief justices. Should there be such a bust? And Chase's friend, Charles Sumner, uh, in a speech that still gets quoted in the Senate, said, no, of course not. You know, Tawney's name should be hooted down in history. Chase, though, I think really believed what Bill said, that he made one big mistake, but he did a lot of other good things that, you know, by and large, that he was a good chief justice, um, and so that he should kind of have his place with his bust in the, in the Supreme Court. And indeed, it is, it is there now. Um, but it, um, uh, I, he was, how should we say, he was a Christian, he forgave. I don't know exactly how he kind of reconciled. But it was not just the one, there were a number of instances in which he said he believed, for example, uh, when Tawney, about a decade after Tawney's death, his daughters were living in poverty and there was an effort to raise money to, you know, support them and Chase donated to that effort, you know, in honor of his predecessor. So, other questions? Yes? You've obviously had a troll of the letters 
And, and where were they, and how is it that they came to be preserved? Um, the letters, there, there are a lot of places, but the two biggest collections of the letters are at the Library of Congress and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, in those days, Chase and others involved in, in you know, politics and law, it was important to keep letters because, you know, you sent a letter saying, you know, da, 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 and then the response might not come for six weeks. And so, you know, if you were going to remember what it was you asked, you know, Ellen to do, well, you had to keep a copy of your outgoing letter and you had to keep a copy of what she responded um, because you might have, you know, yet further back and forth. So he was pretty good at keeping both the letters that he sent and the letters that he received. Um, and then, you know, near the end of his life, um, he started working with a biographer. Um, his daughter had a huge fight with that biographer afterwards, and the letters got divided into these two places, but they've been, they've been kept. Um, uh, in some cases, I had to go to look at them. In other cases, they're, um, they've been edited and printed, and I was able to just read them. So I saw at least one other hand. So, yes? What denomination of U.S. paper money does his, his name and picture appear on? The $10,000 bill. Um, yeah, and there aren't very many. I mean, they haven't printed them in ooh, 40, 50 years. So if you can find one, I think that it'll cost you closer to a million dollars to to buy one of those notes. Um, in the Wall Street Journal review, they, they have a large image. During the war, um, he created what were called greenbacks because they were printed on a green paper. Uh, and he put his own picture, you know, along Lincoln's picture, Hamilton's picture on different denominations. But his picture was on the one dollar greenback, and they had a picture of that in the Wall Street Journal um, uh, review. Um, so, you have to talk about his daughter and the racy husband. Uh, the daughter and the racy husband. Okay. So he had two daughters um, who survived to adulthood. Uh, one very beautiful, uh, headstrong Kate, uh, and one much more quiet, bookish, artistic Nettie. And no one has. There, there are books about Kate. Uh, one of them is entitled "Dominant Daughter." Uh, <laughs> um, there, no one's ever written a book about Nettie, and so I tried in my book to give a little more play to Nettie and her. Um, her letters and her um, personality. But, but Kate was the one that, that Cindy's asking about. Um, after kind of flirting with various men, including, for example, the future president, James Garfield, who is a union general, and she goes out to his camp and spends time with him, there's only one minor flaw in the ointment, which is that Garfield is married. Gar Garfield's wife hears about Kate, and she writes to Garfield and says, so, is she very beautiful? If she is, I might be inclined to be jealous. Um, uh, but after all that, she, um, she settles upon this very wealthy senator from Rhode Island by the name of William Sprague. Um, his family fortune has come from um, textile mills there in Rhode Island. And she marries him in what's kind of the, the grandest wedding of Civil War Washington. Um, Abraham Lincoln and almost all the other cabinet members are there, and they head off on their honeymoon to Europe, and it all looks wonderful, and it's terrible. Uh, because he's a drinker, and he's a womanizer, and he's actually violent, too. Um, and when they finally divorce, which almost never happens in the 19th century, the divorce papers, oh my goodness, you know, I mean, there's an account of how he attempts to throw her out of the upstairs window of their, of their Rhode Island mansion. Um, and, you know, my subject is Chase, and one of the things that I keep asking, and I hope the reader kind of contemplates, is 
why didn't he see that this was an unsuitable husband? And why didn't he sort of do what Cindy does in her premarital counseling and say, you know, really, this is really just not a good idea. Um, I was telling you while I was reading it, she should not marry this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I sort of feel like if, if her father had tried to say anything, that she was so headstrong that that would have made her sort of rush even more rapidly into the arms of this utterly unsuitable man. Dominant daughter. Dominant daughter. Yeah, right. I was fascinated by his cleverness as a lawyer. I had never encountered the Louisiana Purchase Argument, which he developed and then didn't go anywhere. Can you talk on the, and you probably the first person that has looked at that hard in decades. Yeah. So he, you know, when he started in anti-slavery, folks kind of, you know, they, they, they looked at various bits of the Constitution and they sort of thought of the Constitution as, as a kind of supporting slavery. So they looked at things like the three-fifths clause, which counts the slaves as three-fifths of a person for purposes of determining how many seats in Congress the states get. And he said, no, no, we're going to turn this on our, its head. We're going to look at the Constitution as being mainly an anti-slavery document, one that does everything it can to kind of limit slavery. And one of the points that he developed was this notion that because the, the due process clause guarantees of the, the Fifth Amendment guarantees everyone the right to life, liberty, property. That when the federal government acquired territory, like the Louisiana Territory or the Florida Territory, that the federal government couldn't allow slavery in those territories, and thus that states formed out of those territories also couldn't inherit slavery. So this argument basically said, well, you can have slavery in South Carolina, you can have slavery in North Carolina, but you can't have slavery in Louisiana or Arkansas or Missouri because those came to us as federal territory and there can't be slavery in federal territory. So it was a creative argument. In the end, it might have been one of those legal arguments that's a little too clever a little too creative. I'm not sure that it's really right. I think that maybe it's right as to territories, but I'm not sure about the, 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 the states that come out of it. Um, but he, he is you know, a really good lawyer. I mean, he argues cases in the Supreme Court in the 50s that are not just, he argues some slavery cases, but he also argues a, a major patent case in the Supreme Court. And the arguments that he made in that case are still sort of good law and cited in patent cases. Um, uh, you know, I, I, this is one part of the book that I feel I can bring. I, I, I'm a lawyer and I appreciate good lawyers and he was a really good lawyer. Other questions? Oh, come on. So I ask a question about... Actually, how did his life end up? I'm not sure I recall. Did he retire? He died in office? I can't remember. So when he was in his early 60s, um, he, on a trip back from the West to New York, he suffered on a train, a severe stroke. And he, um, his daughters kind of managed to get him to a hotel in New York City, and then they took him up to, um, Kate and her husband had a summer cottage in Narragansett, I think it was much more than a cottage. Um, <laughs> uh, and he spent oof, several months there uh, recuperating. Um, and um, he, I think, Today, he almost certainly would have retired from the Supreme Court, but in those days, the, they didn't have kind of uh, pensions for federal judges. Um, and so he stayed on on the Supreme Court. He returned and he carried on, although he was definitely not sort of 
as, as sharp um, or as strong as he had been before the stroke. He carried on for another mm, year and a half. Um, and then after a, um, the end of the term of the Supreme Court, and I guess I should mention one, one of his last decisions, since I've got more, more women here than men, one of his very last decisions in the Supreme Court um, uh, dealt with a woman that uh, wanted to become a member of the bar of Illinois. Um, and she was fully qualified. She'd passed the bar exam. The only problem was that she was a woman. Um, and she sued the state of Illinois when it denied her a license. And um, uh, the decision in the Supreme Court was eight to one against her. Chase was the one who dissented. Um, and his view was, look, the 14th Amendment, which is now part of the Constitution, guarantees you, you know, the right to pursue your profession, and the state of Illinois can't <coughs> deny you. Um, um, by that point, he was also in favor of voting rights for women, and this is 50 years before women finally get the right to vote. Anyway, so after that decision, he heads up to New York and stays a couple days with Nettie, and one morning... Um, his black valet comes into the room and Chase is, is lying there. He's suffered a second stroke. He never says another word. He never emerges from the coma. He dies the next day. And it's a, it, you know, how to put it, it's a big deal funeral. There's a huge funeral in New York City and then he lies in state in the Capitol. The then president comes to attend the funeral and perhaps circling back to Black History Month, um, more notable, um, hundreds if not thousands of blacks line up to pay their respects to Chief Justice Chase um, uh, as he lies in state in the Capitol. All right, I can do one more question if, if people have it. Um, yes, Reverend Hall. Um, a few years ago I read, uh, which is a wonderful book, Grant's Memoirs, yes. and, uh, what surprised me was that Grant's military career was tied to his being a Republican. I mean, he advanced because of his Republican identity. Yes. As did McClellan advance because of his Democratic identity. And we don't do we don't do that anymore. We don't have overtly partisan people in the military. Yes. And, you know, nor do we, it seems to me, in, in the judiciary. And I'm just wondering your sense of why that changed. I mean, we still have partisan partisanship in the judiciary, right? but it seems that we're no longer at a moment where your career is advanced yeah. in either sphere because of your party identity. And I just wondered if you had a sense of when why that changed. Um, that is an interesting question because certainly. Um, it's not just in the Civil War, in the Mexican War, in the War of 1812. Everyone knew the party identifications of leading generals. Um, Could it be the assassination of uh, Chester Allen Arthur? Yeah, I mean, I think this changes in the late 19th century with the the civil service movement and although that doesn't explicitly deal with the military, I think it changes the culture and it becomes sort of inappropriate to think about the, the party identification of generals. Um, but certainly in the Civil War, you're absolutely right. I mean, Chase, every general with whom Chase corresponded, and he corresponded, I, I found, with you know, more than three dozen generals, you know, he could tell you the party background of that general, and Lincoln very carefully tried to promote both Democrats and Republicans to try to kind of create a more kind of bipartisan support for the, the Civil War. So, I'm told we will not wish to miss the procession, so why don't we call it a day, get over there, and be part of the procession. <laughs>